back in 1986 talking about how small the world is, uh, also how small, if you will, uh, uh, the major issue that I'm going to talk about today is reservations. Back in 1986, I asked Shubhashish to do a paper on a project that I was working on, on reservations in, the, in Malaysia. And actually, it was affirmative action in Malaysia. Uh, one of the surprising things uh, that I want to mention over here during the course of both writing this paper and otherwise is that there's precious little discussion in India about the difference between affirmative action and reservations. So if you, and especially if you are liberal, so if we think we want or have liberalism, this is, if you will, one of the first places to start as to why is it that Indians take it for granted that really reservations is the only way uh, to help the poor, to help the downtrodden, uh, the only way to do affirmative action. And I will come into a little bit of detail on that uh, in a minute. <clears throat> now, you know, reservations in education and in, in jobs is a central issue that I have explored in this paper. One, and I, you know, would do a poll if you had a time, but I would guarantee you that a vast proportion of both people here and certainly a much larger proportion of people outside who know about the subject will say that reservations for, for education for scheduled caste and scheduled tribes is part of the Constitution of India, right? Well, it so happens it is not the case. The Constitution of India never, ever says that the reservation of educational institutions and, and if you will, jobs should be for the scheduled caste and scheduled tribe. They go out of the way to say that, listen, it should be the backward classes. Remember the OBC legislation that came out in the 1990s, and your instinctive reaction, and indeed while writing the paper, you say otherwise backward costs, but it is otherwise backward classes. So one major question is how does it come about that all of us believe, large proportion, that basically reservations for scheduled castes and scheduled tribes is in the Constitution of India. It comes about, and this took, and this is what half of my paper goes through in, in detail, and I think there are some lawyers over here, and I would love to get their reaction, <clears throat> that basically it comes about because there is one place where it is specifically targeted at the scheduled castes and scheduled tribes, and that is in the case of seats in parliament. Seats in parliament at the national level and, if you will, at the state level and the assembly level is stated in the Constitution that we will have this. It is also stated in the Constitution or, if you will, explicitly, um, explicitly formulated that this policy of, guarantee, of having reserved seats in Parliament, which is about as illiberal an idea as anybody could imagine, and Ambedkar was a liberal, but he was giving in to the pressure, and he said that this thing should be reviewed after 10 years. This is the policy that had to be reviewed after 10 years, and indeed, every 10 years, every liberal, everybody in India has approved it and postponed it and, po if you will, amended the Constitution. It's actually an amendment in the Constitution every 10 years, and now, the, if you will, the amendment of the Constitution uh, will be needed in 2020 to extend this principle. So, <clears throat> if you will, this thing, why has it come about? And if you will hear, the Supreme Court is about the guiltiest person because they are supposed to interpret the Constitution. It so happens that 
most civilized places, the Supreme Court does interpret the Constitution, but not in a country like India. And indeed, the chapter is called Half Pregnant Constitution, Half Pregnant State. I should have called it Half Pregnant the Supreme Court. Why the half pregnancy bit? Another, another if you will, um, law that we have in India, fully supported by the Supreme Court, if not promulgated by it, is that only 50% of the reservations, as I said, it's not in the Constitution, it is the implementation, the Supreme Court has implemented it, and has said that, listen, no more than 50% of the people, that is, scheduled caste, scheduled tribes, and now OBCs, will be eligible for reservations. Now, can anybody, any legal scholar, any humanist, can anybody interpret that? If it is a constitutional right, then you cannot have, by definition, 50%. If it is not a constitutional right, then what is the Supreme Court saying by saying that this is the law of the land? I don't know any liberals who's objected to this, or anybody else for that matter. But it seems to me to make, if you will, it is, it's, you know, another point on this and the Supreme Court, because this is to do with the Constitution, is that there are more amendments to the Constitution in India than any place in the world. Indeed, there are more, we change our Constitution, amend our Constitution faster than you change your toothbrush. There are 125 constitutional amendments, and each amendment, if you will, has several amendments between them. I'm not counting those, but we have to take recourse to the fact that we have 125 amendments in the space of 65 years. The US, I think, over 200 and whatever, has 19 amendments or 27 amendments. It doesn't matter. By an order of magnitude, we have more amendments. So the central point I want to make over here, the first point, and I'll soon come to the second point as to who it has hurt and why it is obscene that we have this policy, is that it is not in the Constitution of India, but the Supreme Court has interpreted it to be in the Constitution of India and has put in, if you will, uh, laws to perpetuate this lie. Another point, that in the OBC, and again, it was otherwise backward classes, that when that amendment was made back in the early 90s, uh, <clears throat> the, with, the, with the stipulation that there'll only be 50% of uh, total uh, people who will be taken advantage of it, in 99, we have the first, and this is where, you know, our policymakers think either the people are stupid, and this was the point I raised early on, they can't do calculus, therefore blah, 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 therefore we have local parentis, and we need enlightened individuals to guide them. So when we brought in this OBC legislation, the OBC population in India, otherwise backward classes, according to the 99 NSS survey, 99-2000 NSS survey, was somewhere around 34%. So 24, if you will, 27 are the SCSTs and 34 making a total of 61%. Now, <clears throat> four years later, 2004-05, they did the, and by this time the benefits have begun to trickle down to all those uh, people who uh, uh, wanted it and so on and so forth, that you had the largest ever population growth rate of a group of people than ever recorded in history. There is, amongst demographers, there is this rule that basically, not the rule, the finding, um, that essentially the most, uh, that, and this is based on a on population that uh, does not practice birth control, that essentially a woman can have on average, some will have more, some will less, but on average about nine and a half kids um, during the entire fertility period. And this rate of growth of population of the OBCs was much higher than, if you will, the equivalent of nine and a half kids per person. So people responded, 
especially those who uh, were on the borderline of ABC, or those who were not OBCs, in order to defeat uh, this very uh, purpose of equality. And somebody had mentioned about egalitarian. The whole thing was meant to uplift the downtrodden. Okay? And the downtrodden or the disadvantaged, whatever you want to call them, uh, people who had been discriminated against, the whole works. The whole policy was meant to help them. Now, let, and the major instrument of helping the poor anywhere in the world is via education. And this is where I come to the highly illiberal Nehru regime. Because what did Nehru do? Contrary to every developing country model at that time, since then, before then, was that in order to help the disadvantaged, you provide them with education. Because education is a necessary step for your upliftment. Otherwise, it, it is impossible. Okay. Second, what did an education in primary schools and in secondary schools and in high schools is absolutely necessary for you to enter college? Now, what did Nehru do in his liberal, quote unquote, educational policy to help the disadvantaged? We have reservations on the one side, and then we made sure that basically these people wouldn't have the education because we started put all our resources, the, the public sector resources, into, the, into the, the great IITs and temples of wisdom or whatever, or temples of corruption, whatever you want to call it, we put a disproportionately large amount of money in the higher education, which is about the most elitist, if you will, concept any country has done. You, you look at the evidence in any country in the world that has tried to reform and has tried to help the disadvantaged, the first place they do it is through education. The second place they do it is through health universal health care or trying to improve the health care. And is it any wonder, and I think this was mentioned in one of the, uh, by one of the commentators, that basically health care and education, all other things being equal, are about the worst in India compared to other developing countries at similar stages of development, though I think there has been large improvements in this area. Nevertheless, this is an opportunity that we lost. And now, my final point, who does it hurt? Does it come as any surprise that the one group, and this is discussed in the paper with evidence, that the one group, the reservation policy in India has really hurt, are the Muslims. So they, if you could think of, as a matter of fact, I'm challenging you to think of a more anti-Muslim policy than the policy of reservations that we followed in India. And one of the interesting things that's come out is that the people we think are not, not right or left, but nuts, the RSS, is the one and only political organization that has come out now stating that reservations should be based on economic backwardness. And the moment we have economic backwardness, as part of the principle of reservations, and I'll come to last minute on the affirmative action, that this will help the Muslims the most. Now, coming to what, is, what have most countries done in terms of reservations, they have discarded the notion of reservations, instead brought in the notion of affirmative action. Whether, and CCS has been, if you will, talking about this for a long time, education vouchers, whatever you want to call it, that basically the affirmative action, providing scholarships, providing fellowships, providing living expenses, you name it, for those people in need is a most egalitarian policy. And that is something we do not follow because we say that it is a basis on caste and it is so because it is stipulated in the Constitution of India. So I think time has come, in my view, um, that the Supreme Court and the Constitution of India both need to be looked at uh, again. 
the Supreme Court, because in my humble view, uh, is not very concerned, has not been very concerned about interpreting the Constitution. And I can give you examples on cow slaughter and various other uh, areas in which the Supreme Court has gone way off um, the edge or in the terms of education. And the Constitution, you know, in the, in the late 90s, early 2000s, uh, Bajpai had set up a commission to, if you will, d discuss and study the idea of a new Constitution. Um, the Triple Talaq Uniform Civil Code was also mentioned in the earlier. I think it's high time liberals supported the idea of that we need to take another look at the Constitution of India. Thank you. Let me start with a sort of clarification and an admission. Uh, I began working on this topic of securing safety net right, as a way of solving a problem. I wasn't sure at the time whether the solution that may come about is going to be consistent with liberal libertarian principles or not. Right? So it was very sort of mechanical engineering exercise that this is the challenge that we are facing. This is what's happening around the world. Obviously, Greece and other countries which are going into default was also part of what was uh, in the motivation behind uh, this exercise. Right? And obviously, India is also walking on the similar path of state-supported, state-created sort of welfare system. Right? So NREGA is part of it, the right to food, and many other rights that we are slowly introducing uh, in the country are all moving us in the direction of a state-dominated welfare system. Right? So I thought it would be good to sort of think through, is there another alternative uh, to the current model, right? which seems to be quite universal. Of course, most Western countries have the model, and so do now countries like India uh, following in the same footsteps. What I'm going to do is just to give you a little context of what it is. The second part, which is my motivation, and I think this is an important contribution in a sense to the discussion around welfare state, right? Is what is the right kind of welfare state? It's quite surprising when you look at the literature that there is hardly any discussion about parameters through which you will judge whether a welfare state is performing well or not. Uh, it, it sort of, to me, it was quite shocking the amount of money that is being spent uh, in, this, in this area and the larger public discussion that happens uh, on it. Right? There's hardly any clarification or attempt even to specify what makes a good welfare state. Right? And then I offer sort of one solution that uh, I engineered and see whether what you think of that. The idea behind that solution is what I call sustenance and selfhood paradigm. What I'm arguing is that the current welfare state provides only material support. Right? But we know from our own experience and large amount of critique uh, that is being done to the welfare state, particularly from the conservatives uh, around the world, uh, tells us that just by giving money or material support, you are not going to be able to help all the people. Uh, just take an example of being unemployed. Right? I may be unemployed because of various reasons. Right? A state can simply provide me unemployment insurance or a benefit. Right? It would not be able to help me to get back into the job, get back on my feet. Right? Uh, and therefore, what I argue is that we need to have a combination of support. One, obviously, the material support, the sustenance support, and the second, what I call selfhood support, Basically meaning behavioral, emotional, moral, maybe in some cases even spiritual, right? Support the people who need to get back on their feet, right? And that will vary from individual to individual, and therefore there's a need for a personalized welfare system as opposed to a massive bureaucracy or bureaucratic welfare system that we have developed around the world. So that's the basic uh, idea uh, behind it. What is a welfare state? I think it's a good summary. I also like the, to rephrase uh, Frederick Bastia. A state is a fiction through which everybody wants to live at the expense of everybody else. Right? And the similar, you can, similarly, you can say about the welfare state. Right? What I have done is to sort of 
being a little more precision in the discussion, uh, I sort of divide the state functions into three broad buckets, right? One, what I call the rights protection, protecting our life, liberty, and property. Uh, second is provision of public goods, uh, education, healthcare, and many of those. Even though I think most economists in the room would sort of uh, cringe uh, hearing that education is a public good, but uh, that's how currently being uh, interpreted. Right? Uh, and the third is what I refer to as welfare or entitlement. Uh, the difference between the second and the third is that the second is universal, is available to everyone, while the welfare is targeted towards specific groups of individuals. Right? It's not in that sense universal. So currently the system that we have is citizens pay taxes to the state, state runs these three functions, right protection, public goods, and welfare. Citizens also do philanthropy and, and support uh, CSOs, community or civil society organizations. Right? Some funding also comes from the state to those CSOs. And since CSOs are, and in many cases, implementing agencies uh, for the state. Right? So this is the current allocation of resources. Right? I'm going to talk about now what's a good welfare system, and then I bring back to the cycle of how to reallocate resources. So I'd first parameter, I think, is to promote self-reliance. At the end of the day, the purpose of welfare system should be to help the people to get back on their feet. Right? So promote self-reliance, promote self-help, however you want to phrase that idea. But something around that has to be the core objective of a welfare system. Second is what I argued earlier, that provides both sustenance as well as self-food support, material as well as moral support the people need to get back on the feet. Third, uh, that is to involve more actively the citizens, now, not just in terms of paying taxes uh, and then saying that, okay, I have done my job, now rest is what government is supposed to do. Right? And that's what you actually hear in many of the uh, sort of opinion polls right, in the Western countries. Right? When you ask them, what have you done on your own? People say, well, I pay my taxes to help the fellow citizens. So we have to change that system. We need to bring about more active engagement uh, of the citizen. And of course, fourth follows the third. If you're going to have more active engagement of citizens, you need to have more decentralized uh, governance structure for the welfare system. Right? And therefore, of course, direct accountability that we talked about, I think Jay, Jay Prakash mentioned in the morning. Right? Accountability and authority sort of goes together in some ways. And this is one way of thinking about and the point number three and four. So those are the sort of four parameters that I identify as what defines a good welfare system. Right. And I'm going to sort of build on them as we go along. One reason why I think the CSOs are important uh, in this picture is largely to provide the moral, emotional, behavioral support, right, which would not be provided by the uh, bureaucratic agency. Right. Uh, and the support that they would provide sort of fits into Amritya Sen's framework of capability, right? Uh, so what the framework argues is that you have various commodities, money, goods, uh, services. People have their own personal characteristics as individuals, and they live in a particular social system, cultural system, and the system also has its own sort of characteristics, right? Combination of those two allow people to then convert their commodities or resources into functioning or capabilities, right? And that, in a sense, allows what I'm assuming that as getting back on your feet, in a sense. Right? And this is the role uh, that the CSOs play, is to help in this area to make sure that whatever resources or sustenance which is available uh, through the state or otherwise is, in a sense, utilized in a manner so that the person is able to achieve the capacities and capabilities and functionies that the person wants, right? I find this language very confusing. Uh, my colleague have, have tried very hard to sort of figure out how to re-articulate sense approach, but there seems to be they have used so many different terms uh, in describing that approach. This becomes quite confusing for most people on the first brush. 
uh, so how do we bring about the change in the current system right so what i propose simply is that a part of the let me put the whole thing up part of the tax that i pay i should have authority to pay that directly to the csos So currently, of course, I pay full amount of tax to the state, and state then runs these welfare services. What I'm proposing is that we need to democratize the allocation of tax revenue. Right? Today, the tax revenue is only in the control of the state right? or elected representative bodies. Right? We need to find a way to engage citizens in the allocation of that tax revenue. Right? So part of the tax is paid to the CSOs. You can think of various other systems that would need to be created. For example, a system uh, to inform citizens about what the CSOs are doing, uh, a system which will emerge automatically in the ecosystem in terms of rating performance of the CSOs, uh, and thereby helping citizens to decide which CSOs they should contribute to. Right? Uh, you can see immediately the engagement of taxpayers uh, in understanding what is happening uh, in their own neighborhood or in the state or the country and who is doing what kind of work. Right? So you are forcing in indirectly by giving them power to allocate funds to engage with the sort of welfare system or the self-help system to which they have no incentive today to engage other than uh, to sort of grieve and whine about it. So there are different ways of doing this uh, to convert uh, sustenance and moral support. Uh, Something that we are trying to do in India, convert all the welfare services into direct benefit transfer. So cash transfer is one simple way of doing it. So material support to the individuals comes in terms of cash, and the moral support comes uh, through the CSOs. Right? So that's the one way of thinking about the model. I also took that argument one step further and say not just the direct cash transfers, but what we should be doing actually is to convert much of other provisions by the state, which can be converted into cash, right, into a direct, what I call a sustenance transfer, which could be bigger than the direct benefit transfer. Right? So a state basically provides you sustenance in terms of cash as opposed to any in any other form. Right? State could still run the schools and colleges, run the hospitals if they want to, but those are physical services that the state provides. Anything that can be converted into money gets converted into money uh, in terms of direct sustenance transfer. So that's sort of one model of thinking about how you can build in the existing welfare system uh, around the new idea of engaging citizens in the process. The second approach, which I find a lot more, a lot more appealing, uh, is that to allow citizens to allocate resources not only to CSOs, but also to some of the ministries which provide welfare services or public goods. So some part of the, and we, this is something open to debate, uh, what proportion of tax dues that I have to pay, I can allocate either to the CSOs or to the ministries. But it has to be somewhat substantial amount. It can't be 2 to 5%. It has to be about, I suspect, 20 25% uh, of what taxes I pay that I get to allocate directly uh, to the ministries as well as to the CSOs. Of course, ministries will continue to get their funding from the state as they normally do. Uh, some part of the funding they get from the state, and some part they obviously would have to get uh, from the citizens, citizen taxpayers. Right. What happens in this case is there is a direct competition between the state ministries that provide these welfare services with the CSOs, which are also providing very similar kind of services. Right. So what you would see every year is an appeal from the Minister of say, Health that I have put on the picture here right, uh, to the taxpayers that please allocate more, amount, more part of your tax dues to my ministry because this is what I have done last year. Right? So they would have to begin to focus on the performance and also on the outcomes of what they are doing. They cannot take it for granted. The budget will keep coming as it has come uh, in the past. Right? And this will be interesting competition to watch. Right? This is what sorry, I find very exciting, that you have Minister of Health on one hand, and uh, here I have put example of Arvind Ai, 
I care, uh, uh, chairman, both appealing to citizens and taxpayers uh, why they should give money to them, right? And you can see this have working across various welfare services. Last uh, sort of point about how the system would work. One argument I have, and this is something I think we should, maybe you would have some uh, more to say, is that I don't want, and this is welfare to be a right. right. One part of the conservative critique is that by making it a right, you have taken away the moral dimension of that whole process. Right? For me to help someone, and for a person who receives the help, also to have a sense of gratitude towards the people who are providing that help. Right? So that moral dimension that actually brings accountability has been completely removed by making something like welfare as a right. right? Yes, there's an argument in favor of right, saying that uh, people who otherwise would not ask for help uh, if they have to feel obliged. Right? Uh, and therefore, right makes it easier for people to simply claim uh, that support as their own. Right? Uh, but I think overall, what we see currently, and this is my judgment call, I don't have much research to sort of support it, is that by making it a right, uh, we are actually undermining the large part of what makes the self-help support effective. Right? And therefore, it has to be based on a request. So it's not my right, it's my request for help. Right? So I, in a sense, the, you can think of various ways to implement this idea. One that I talk about briefly in the chapter is that you actually apply for help. So you can you describe what kind of help you need. Either it's just money or something else, right? And that then it goes to the, through the system, and the system then provides you that help, right? Only check I have in, this, in my chapter is that there is a negative list of people who would not receive this help, right? So those who are, say, taxpayers, those who have cars, those who have foreign travel, you can eliminate those people from receiving any help, right? And therefore, this is somewhat different than the currently debated idea of universal basic income, right, uh, which is given to everyone. Right? Uh, so this is actually not given to everyone. It's given to only some people. And even in that case, only upon request uh, and not automatically. I think that's probably does. Yeah, this is the same slide I have as a closing. Good, thank you. And I must thank CCS and Parth and uh, Norman Foundation for giving me the opportunity to write this because I think it had been a very rich learning experience for me. But having written that, in fact, after three months, I, was, I just opened it to know, remember, remind myself what did I actually write. <laughs> but I thought I'll take this opportunity to push myself further. It's been a long time since what I should say, the confession, because the article, the paper that I wrote was more an autobiographical confession of my failures rather than anything else, that I'd rather take this opportunity to share with you how I may have learned something or tried to learn something. And I wish I was in the session with Jerry. I tried to persuade the organizers to put me in the session with Jerry. But perhaps we'll get a chance to share later. The question is, and like you saw just now with the, with the period uh, with Surjit and Parth and the morning session particularly, what do we, how do we assess liberalism? In a sense, is it a success? JP quite rightly said that the liberal ideas have dominated the world even if liberal parties haven't, lately at least. Or as some of others have written, that democracy itself is under threat uh, over the last five, six years, particularly over the past decade, because just think of the change that has happened. I find it amazing that just 20 years ago, in the first half of the 1990s, we had the clash of civilization and end of history. Today, 20 years later or a generation later, there's a lot of discussion in India and across the world now, actually, and irrespective of the outcomes of the US election, incidentally. 
that democracy itself, the idea of democracy itself is under scanner. And again, this is not a new phenomenon. The idea of democracy was questioned in ancient Greece, as somebody in the morning pointed out. It was questioned at the, start, at the founding of the American Constitution, Revolution. And it has been questioned, particularly now, at the, at the, in the second decade of the 21st century. What's happening? And the reason I'm saying this, and again, somebody mentioned that these are conferences like people like us, which it is. And I must say another group of friends I should thank is Arch, Amrish, Trupti, Anil Bhai in Gujarat, who really gave me a unique opportunity to look beyond people like us, beyond conferences in Delhi, Bombay, Calcutta, to actually go to India that I may not have seen at all. Or if I had been there, I would not have had the eyes to look at. And I really realized, and that is partly in my paper, so I'll not disappoint you by not referring to the paper, that I really re be began to feel and actually realize that our single biggest weakness has been our lack of stomach to take our fight beyond people like us. We enjoy talking to ourselves, and I'm very glad that it's a coincidence, but it's a very fortunate coincidence. I think it's a once in a lifetime opportunity that life, last five years, because of Arch, I could see parts of India and talk to, engage with people where many of the things that we discuss today are irrelevant. For instance, Sujit mentioned reservation. We have had self-immolation in Delhi on reservation. So it's a very emotive issue. But go beyond urban India. 90% of Indians have no hope, no expectation even, of ever getting into anything that will require reservation. They're in the informal economy. Barely 15% are, com are completing college. The dropout rates being what they are. So what are they expecting? And I began to realize something that I had not realized before, and something which Lavish also in the earlier session, in the first session mentioned, that we, I realized that we completely misunderstand politics. How many of you in this room look upon politics as something that's desirable, something that you'd like to enter? JP did. But how many, how many of us actually look upon politics as something that inspires? something that we'd like to engage in, something that, uh, that we'd like to do in order to bring in the change that we think we should. Very few. There's only one hand there. Two. Dhanu here. Three. Four. Even Jerry, I'm surprised, having tried it. Yeah. But I think, I think you know, there's a reason, and that's because we, I think we completely misunderstand what do we mean by politics and what we mean by democracy because these two things are, in a way, related. And politics, mind you, is much more basic than democracy in an electoral sense of getting a majority. We can't escape politics even in our home, in our communities, in our villages, in our housing societies, in our states, in our countries. We can't. In our, co in our companies, in our organizations. Politics is about managing people. Primarily managing people. That's what politicians are most capable of. They can mobilize and manage hundreds, thousands, millions. And the man who actually transformed Indian politics is Gandhi himself, the original Gandhi. Yeah. He transformed a group of intellectuals educated elite of India more than 100 years ago into a mass movement. We liberals lost that battle because we let it, I mean, not just Gandhi, subsequently, across the world, not just in India. We took the ascendancy of liberal ideas for granted and believed there's no reason to take it beyond people like us. 
I really think we lost that battle because we for forgot or we failed to discover. Somebody mentioned language in the morning. And language, I don't mean the dialect. I mean, I'm speaking in English today. I could, always, I could perhaps try Bengali or Hindi, or some of you could try some other language. It's not the language as such. It's how you use the language to connect. And the man who taught the whole world this is the original Gandhi. You know, if you, if you, and which is in my paper, incidentally, that I began to look at him, not somebody as a Mahatma, but somebody who could reach people to change people. And my conclusion of, of, of his success, to the extent that he had, and he had enormous success as a politician, was he exhibited leadership that we today only dream of. He inspired people who followed him. Today, the only leadership we know is pandering to the lowest common denominator. Gandhi inspired that among his followers because he earned the credibility among his followers, for which he spent decades, every decade, going out and meeting to people not like him, not the drawing room of Congress, not the liberal conferences and seminars in Delhi. I think we need to, we really need to discover the art of communication Hindol was mentioning, but art of communication to people much beyond the kind of circles we are used to. That is what is politics. That is what politicians do. But it's not just politicians. They're only middlemen. They're brokers just like traders and, and brokers in the economic market. They specialize in negotiating, in bargaining. We condemn from this side of the table, it's very easy for us to condemn politicians for selling out on principles. But politicians are practitioners. And again, I mentioned it in the paper, that as an engineer, I'm a practitioner. As a physicist, I could be a theoretician. And as an engineer, I know that every action, every principle of physics that I put into play would have efficiency losses. That's exactly what a politician does. You engage in a real world, you are going to have efficiency losses. The question is whether you classify them as efficiency losses or whether you classify them as selling out on principles. Because unless we can figure out, because all discussion and the reason why, I mean, I'm no longer enamored by seminars of this kind, although I'm grateful to Parth and FNF for giving me the opportunity last year, because it made me think beyond what I was actually doing. And I'm using this opportunity to think of something, even though Parth has not yet given me an opportunity for a next book, but I'm thinking of how I'll build my next step as part of my learning, and I'm sharing that with you. Politics is about people. The creativity lies in being able to interpret principles in a way that people can understand. Think of the salt movement of Gandhi. Did the salt bring down the British Empire? Of course it didn't. But can you think of a movement that galvanized millions across India, at a time when there was no social media, no television, no radio. Because he connected. And he could connect because he had spent 10, 15 years before that going out to understand and discover the other India. How many of us have the stomach to do that? Even I didn't have the stomach to do that. I don't think I, I have understood that at all. After 20 years of engaging into the ideas debate, it's only in the last five since I began to see the kind of uh, at, uh, ground level activities that Arch and others are involved in that I began to realize where we may have missed the boat altogether. And the consequences are heavy, very significant in my view. One, 
we devalue and delegitimize politics as such. And two, we completely lose faith or confidence in the people whom we have to take along with us. We think they are gullible, they are fools, they are idiots, they can be sold for a few pennies of subsidies. Gandhi didn't sell subsidies. He still got millions. And I think we need to figure out how to communicate in a manner that is credible. For that, we don't need to know whom we want to reach out. And to do that, we must respect the person to whom we are trying to reach out. That is how I believe Gandhi inspired time. So to end this, I'd say the relationship that I was trying to, I'm trying to draw between politics and democracy are in twofold. One, we should not fall into the trap of delegitimizing politics because then we'll end up undermining democracy. The reaction across the world has been a reaction to delegitimization of politics. That's how political outsiders can simply come in riding the white horse because politics have been de uh, delegitimized. And second, democracy is not about majority rule. That's, most, that's only the operational principle. That majority has to decide on a particular issue. Democracy primarily is about respect and recognition for debate and dissent. Because if, if, you do, if we do not allow freedom to express and particularly express dissent, there can't be any democracy. We'll have only one election once. Elections are meaningful only because over the period of the next four or five years, people can debate and dissent and change their opinion. It is this ch possibility of change that makes democracy powerful, not the majority rule. Majority is transient. The process is permanent. Which means we should not fall into the trap of believing that in a country of teeming millions, Till, uh, I mean, most, a lot of them in poverty, Surjit might debate the number 15% or 25%, but it's a large number. And in relative poverty, many are, if not absolute poverty. Illiter uh, literacy is still a challenge in large parts of India, and therefore it's very easy, very easy. And I am as guilty as anybody else to assume that people at the other end have no capacity to understand and appreciate the principles we are talking of. They understand and appreciate it much more because their lives depend on that principle much more, which is what I learned primarily because of the engagement Arch has been involved on land and property rights. We don't have to, it's in Delhi in Constitution Club and, uh, and Habitat Center that I might have to debate the validity of property rights and whether right to property in the Constitution should have been there or not. In none of the villages I've visited so far have I had to ever debate the validity of the right to property. People take it for granted. If that is, a live, that is an advantage we are not able to leverage, it's completely our own failure. Thank you very much. Satya once again from uh, Jindal Global Law School. So there are a few things that you said that I agree with, so I'll just mention what those are. I agree with you that, <clears throat> that we have seen too many constitutional amendments. I agree with you that the Supreme Court is to blame for, <coughs> sorry, is to blame for uh, misreading equality in, in some ways. And I agree with you that every once in a while our constitution needs a, some sort of a review. So we should have some uh, kind of a review commission every uh, 25 years or 30 years. <coughs> what I don't agree with you is what are the reasons Supreme Court has, uh, or, or where is it that the Supreme Court has faulted? And I uh, also want to sort of clarify certain legal points about uh, where caste is mentioned in the constitution, where reservation is mentioned in the constitution. I also agree with you that affirmative action is not reservation. <coughs> so if you just read from the constitution, Article 15.4 and Article 16.4a talk about affirmative action. 
15 4 talks about socially and educationally backward classes and goes on to mentions or scheduled tribe or scheduled castes. At the time of independence, social backwardness was synonymous with scheduled caste and scheduled tribes. There was no disagreement on this question that if you're talking about socially backward classes, then scheduled caste and scheduled tribes will automatically fall into that zone. On the question of uh, reservation in jobs, there is one more condition that you have, the state can make provisions for socially and educationally backward uh, classes but they also have to be inadequately represented in the jobs. So I agree with you that if tomorrow it is proven or it is agreed upon that scheduled caste and scheduled tribes are adequately represented or represented even more than the share of their population, then we can think about taking them off this list. The other point that I want to make is uh, the, the, the question that you had asked about where this 50 person rule come from. So initially reservation was seen as an exception to the rule of equality. For the first 20 years of India's constitutional jurisprudence, equality was supposed to be the norm, and reservation was sort, supposed or thought of as some exception that you permit for the conditions that were prevalent in the, in the country. But after these 20 years, and equality or reservation started being seen as a part of equality itself, as a necessary concomitant to equality, not as an exception. When it was seen as an exception, there was a case called El Balaji in 1964. That said, because it is an exception, it cannot cross the rule of 50%. Because if it crosses the 50%, then it would become the norm, not the exception. But after 1960, uh, 1964, or the beginning of 1970s, the number of cases, Anam Thomas, Indra Soni, they have always considered reservation to be a part and parcel of equality, not an exception. So they say that equality means differential treatment of differently situated individuals. And if it is shown that 70% of the India needs reservation because they are differently situated, they have not had access to education, then the, the reservation will be a part of the right to equality, not an exception. So that is why, but I agree with you that the 50% rule has no legal backing. Because if it is shown that 90% of India is backward, then this entire norm exception debate is irrelevant. You will have to give reservation to 70, 80%, whichever. The other, the last point that I want to make is where we have fallen, and I agree with you, is that we have not adjusted our understanding of what backwardness is. So there was a point of time when caste became a filter for class, or the backward class. So in 1960s, in 1950s and 1960s, the cases that came before the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court agreed that caste could be a filter for class. But that equation does not maintain anymore. You could say that caste, education, employment, regional disparity, tribal status, a bunch of things could come together to have a more comprehensive understanding of backwardness. And that is what Equal Opportunity Commission that was uh, formed by the UPA government and, the d and then dissolved after two years. No, no. This is, it's very important actually. And clarified the problem. Yeah, yeah. this is the clarification. I want to do the Article 15, which is uh, it's actually funny in parts, but just to show how, uh, what it is. So just the legal, if you will. Prohibition, Article 15 states that prohibition of discrimination on grounds of religion, race, caste, sex, or place of birth. First, 15.1, the state shall not discriminate against any citizen on grounds only if religion, of, of religion, race, caste, sex, place of birth. Having established the principle of human rights and equality before the law, the Constitution begins to get into twists. One would think that women and children are also citizens of India. But the social engineering design of the Constitution, supposedly a document to right all wrongs, is revealed by Article 15.3 that states, nothing in this article should prevent the state from making any special provision for women and children. Then they go on, what the Constitution is trying to state is that all are equal, but that women and children, who constitute approximately two-thirds of the population, are more equal than others, and state power can be used to enhance the state and well-being. Now, this is a constitution. Okay. Then it says, but the confusion about what should be law and human rights and what should be policy is best revealed by the next clause in Article 15.4, which states, quote, nothing in this article or in Clause 2 of Article 29 shall prevent the state from making any special provision for the advancement of any socially and educationally backward classes of citizens or for the scheduled castes and scheduled tribes. 
this is occurs time and again in the Constitution, as you well know, that nothing in the, shall prevent the state. I think, is the Constitution about state rights or is it about individual rights? The biggest, the biggest condemnation of the Indian Constitution is that it's about state rights, what the state can do for you. This is, if you will, all 25 of us uh, liberals that believe that the power of state shall be reduced. The Indian Constitution provides more power to the state of India than anything that I've read. Two very quick uh, questions. One to Parth. You quite rightly talked about the, the rule of law and the first priority of the state, and the second, uh, public goods and services, and third, welfare. Would you envisage any kind of a hierarchy? In other words, is it reasonable for a government to ignore the primary functions as understood as the role of the state in any society, and then take to the third function, which actually yields votes, particularly when there's misgovernance in the other two. I, I, otherwise, if you really treat all of them as equal, then there's a serious problem. That's exactly what most governments in India are doing. And to Sujit, in this group, probably I'm the harshest critic of the Supreme Court, time and again, in public and repeatedly. But perhaps in this case, you're not being very fair. In a very complex political situation, when reconciliation of conflicting interests is extraordinarily difficult in a society like ours, the court is really trying to maintain a ratio, trying to urge some kind of a, a, a balance. It's not a perfect solution, because when there's no way the political process can find solutions realistically, for the reasons we all understand, I think the court is only trying to establish a broader principle that, look, we cannot go overboard because there is a constitutional principle, namely, efficiency of the state functioning cannot be compromised either. So in that guise, the court is trying to say there is a bar. It's not true that the Supreme Court has ever argued that if 90% are backward, 90% reservation is possible. That's never the case in this country. There is a reason why this 50%, it could be 40%, it could be 60%, it's obviously arbitrary. But some ratio is sought to be maintained in order to reconcile conflicting interests, in order to allow the political process to play out, and yet not allow complete subversion of the fundamental principle, namely equality is the norm, this is an exception. Uh, I think you answered your own question, so I would agree with you that there should be some hierarchy in terms of what government performs. Uh, I don't remember this, uh, when the RTE became, came to public debate, there was a group of people who began talking about nine is mine. So the idea behind that was a 6% of GDP should be spent on education, and the 3% should be spent on healthcare, right? And therefore, 9% of GDP should be spent on education and healthcare. And there's a whole national campaign that went on, supported by many multilateral agencies, uh, on nine is mine, right? And I think something similar to that we would have to do for the first function of the state, right? So rights protection part, which we all agree is, and I think even those who are not liberals would agree with that argument that protection of life and liberty and property is probably far more important than government giving you some subsidies, right? And I think it's a general consensus in a sense on that area, but there's no, not much research focus or advocacy on that area. Right. So you don't, when, I, when we try to do some research on this is to figure out how much money is spent on, say, judicial system of India, it's quite difficult to put the number together. Right. Uh, and so I think that research needs to be done to build that argument uh, for why the first function of the state should take uh, supremacy over the others. You know, on both your questions, um, I have fundamental differences. Um, I belong to the school of thought that believes that the Constitution should not be about social engineering. And the Constitution of India is all about social engineering. And, if you will, it's all about states' rights and not about individual rights. So that's the first premise uh, that I start off with and where I think we come from opposite ends. The, the second part of that, which follows from what you have said, and Shubhashish will remember uh, back in the mid-80s, um, <clears throat> I wrote an article on relating to, but in a country like India. 
And I think, and this tends to a little bit of what Barun said, slight disagreement there, that you know, we can't really compare 1916 with 2016. The world has enormously changed uh, in terms of communication, in terms of transmission of information, in terms of whatever one might think of. Um, and I think there is a universality in terms of at least knowledge uh, that we have now. And I think it's time, you know, there's no harm in, if you will, changing uh, the Constitution or changing uh, modus operandi in order to take care of the new information uh, that is available. So I just, you know, notions like we are complex, we are difficult, this, that, every country, look at the U.S., many people will now be saying, now listen, it's a very complex country, there's a lot of this, but the notion of what the Constitution is, what equality means, etc., is should not be subject, and therefore those are absolute rights uh, that shouldn't change uh, over time. And I think, you know, in that sense, um, the U.S. Constitution, which was written in 1776 or 1789, is a much, much, much more far-reaching uh, human rights uh, document uh, than our document, which was written in 1950. This led me to make two points, right? The, the, um, one was that we have very little f faith in what the government can do. That, that, that I felt across the board. And uh, which as an economist, I can tell you that um, one of those disliked social scientists, one, uh, you know, it, it, it is, a, this is a healthy disregard for government, right? You worry about the government. The government is indeed an agent of the people and the agents always tend to go counter to what the principal wants them to do. So it's a healthy regard, right? But the one thing I must say is that if we think about, say, 30, 40 years ago, when we didn't have such a well-developed communication system, the poor still communicated through with each other. The poor still sent money to remotest parts of the country from very remote parts of the country. In other words, we did have a system that worked. And that was because we didn't have a law on that, but we followed universal access right, for the post office. And the post office acted as the center for communication among the poor, among the rich. India, with all its problems, could still deliver a letter within 24 hours. Many couriers don't do it even today. So it is possible to get the government to be efficient and to work if, if we get together, as he said. Right? So, 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 so I, I think we should not go back with a lot of pessimism which I can see in this room. The second thing I want to say is anybody who says, and this I go back to what JP said, anybody who says that the panchayats will make a mess of the money, they will local capture and all of that, please remember that in the 20s and 30s, when the colonies were asking for independence, that is precisely what the British were saying, that will they be able to rule themselves. It's a real irony that close to 70 years after gaining independence, we are telling that about our own third tier of government. That's a bigger irony. That's a much bigger irony. Thank you very much. <laughs>